Salutations, respected viewers. I'm George from Ireland. I'm afraid I've forgotten this clip which kept this thing near my lapel, so I'm just gonna have to hold it. Well, here I am in Barnes, London, and behind me is the house where uh, Henry Fielding lived some of the last years of his life. Though he didn't die here, he'd um, gone to live in, in Lisbon, and that's indeed where he expired. So um, Fielding was not from here, he's from a um, village in Somerset, which is in southwestern England. He came from a wealthy family. His father was a lieutenant general in the army. And of course, you had to, had to purchase your commission right up until the 1860s, which why there were debacle such as um, the charge of the light brigade. Um, so he had a number of siblings, some ways a fairly happy childhood, though his father wasn't, wasn't very good with money and relative to their social standing, their, their, their wealth was not as great as you might imagine. And uh, he was uh, cheerfully uh, irresponsible and self-indulgent, his father. Anyway, when Henry Fielding was, was 11, his mother died and there preceded a court battle between um, Fielding's father and his maternal grandmother who sought custody of him. So that was his first introduction to the law. But um, Henry Fielding was somewhat shielded by this, by, by being at Eton for um, most of this time. Um, and so then he went down from Eton and uh, one of the obvious steps would, go, would be to go to varsity. And there were only two universities in England at the time, Oxford and Cambridge, such places were not terribly difficult to get into. But um, there, there was this curious episode where he attempted to abduct his cousin, uh, his female cousin, I think with the view of marrying her because she was quite affluent. Um, and even though that marriage wasn't entirely voluntary, it was very difficult to get these things annulled. Divorce existed, but it was a very lengthy procedure, extraordinarily expensive and considered to be an absolute disgrace um, to both sinned against and sinning. Anyway, so then for, for, for higher studies, well, he, he um, fled the country because he feared prosecution for attempting to abduct uh, his girl cousin. And he went to the Netherlands, he enrolled at Leiden University. And there, there were quite a few British undergraduates there um, at the time. The Earl of Bute, the Prime Minister, indeed, had studied there. So he was mainly studying classics when, um, when he was there. But I believe he left without a degree. Money, running, money was running short. He came back uh, to this realm. I think he'd been assured he wouldn't be prosecuted after all. And indeed, he wasn't. So he was very close to his blind brother, John. And uh, uh, in his early 20s, Fielding got married to uh, Charlotte Craddock. Um, they, had, um, they had five children, only one of them a daughter. Um, his daughter, whom he loved very dearly, died at the age of 23, just shortly after she, she got married to, to an army officer. But anyway, to sustain his um, growing brood, Fielding turned his hand to writing. Now, the United Kingdom of the early 18th century was one of the first countries to have majority literacy, and Grub Street was flourishing, as in that's where hack writers were who would, you know, knock out penny dreadfuls in a few days. There was um, a thriving... Um, uh, press, just, just, just periodical press, daily newspapers, weekly newspapers. Um, the transport revolution was beginning with turnpike trusts improving roads and stagecoaches going all over the kingdom delivering newspapers. So newspa news had, was reasonably hot, only a few days old from London when it reached the provinces. Um, and uh, there was a seemingly insatiable appetite for newsprint. Um, and then, say, recordings of the supposed last speeches of various people who'd been hanged for their um, crimes, which are now considered misdemeanours, of which more later. Uh, so Fielding eventually was called to the bar, despite his lack of degree, because um, as recently as, say, the 1970s, I'm pretty sure, you could qualify as a barrister without a degree. I've just discovered it is possible to do a graduate diploma in law, even if you don't have a degree, if you prove some sort of exceptional merit. Um, but anyway, precious few people had a degree in those days, perhaps even 1% of the population. So uh, he cut his teeth at the Bar of England. Uh, now, this was a time when political controversy raged. Uh, he firmly identified with the Whig Party, but that didn't mean he wouldn't write for Tory publications because um, uh, needs must for the devil drives, anything for money. Um, and uh, should the Jacobites be restored? Well, he definitely believed they should not, and he was unswerving in his allegiance to the Hanoverian House, that dynasty which ruled this kingdom from 1714 to, to 18... Um, uh, 37, um, who were not popular, especially in the early years. But Jacobitism was associated with, 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 with Catholicism. There was a lot of vicious anti-Catholicism in this country at the time, um, discriminatory laws against us. Um, Fielding was baptised into the Church of England, and he remained a stalwart of it to his dying day. Um, didn't stop him living in a Catholic country at the end of his life. I'm not sure if he was personally anti-Catholic. Um, 
so he uh, he then wrote lots of plays and of course theatre was booming at the time um, there was obviously an upper class who could very easily afford to go there was um, burgeoning middle class some of the working class could go to some of the cheaper shows um, get the cheaper seats and that was live entertainment so uh, it was a rather raucous world with a whiff of the not quite respectable about him but he reveled in it um, despite that he was appointed a magistrate as in a sort of a, the low ranking judge and eventually became the chief magistrate for London dealing with 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 a less serious trials i say less serious you could be still be sent to be hanged by him um, because this was this was an era where even uh, malnourished children could be sentenced to hang for scrumping and made to dance uh, what was it called the the, the um Tyburn frisk as in Tyburn near a certain stream burn as in stream um, just just where um, you know where marble arch is today there's a little uh, stone on the on the uh, traffic island there marked where Tyburn tree was it really had been a tree if you go back centuries but then it became a gallows that could accommodate several clients at it at one time a Tyburn frisk as in they'd be given the short drop the hands tied behind their back their, their, their feet were not tied together um, and so they'd be left to strangle over up to 22 minutes. It was absolutely barbaric. And of course they'd ride like anything and struggle as they slowly asphyxiated, kicking their legs. And then the crowd would be jeering and roaring. So really appeared to the, to the um, brutal and sadistic aspect of public uh, opinion. But um, he was um, aghast at that, but believed that it should be in private. He felt it was um, morally lowering for this to be a matter of public delectation. People just going along for sheer entertainment. The theater was quite different. Um, so his, his blind brother was superb at recognizing criminals because he could remember their voices and saying, you know, have you ever appeared before me for this such and such a crime and, and, and uh, malfeasant denying it. But in fact, John Fielder could recognize that the, the voice and remember him and say, well, you know, you've obviously lied to me under oath, that's perjury, and you've committed this crime before. As a recidivist, you'll get a heavier penalty. And um, Henry Fielding himself was willing to sentence people to death and indeed he did award the capital punishment on several occasions. But uh, this provided him with unparalleled material for his uh, oeuvre. And perhaps his magnum opus is a novel, Tom Jones, about a foundling, i.e. a baby who was just abandoned. Now, um, Coram had, found, uh, had set up his foundling um, hospital not long before. Not really a hospital, an orphanage we'd now say. So uh, children born to impecunious families, children born to unwed mothers, which was a more prevalent, you might think, and maybe not as quite as disgraceful as you might imagine. I mean, amongst the, the working class, or would we say even, even the underclass, this was quite common. They weren't very churched. But uh, anyway, um, poverty-stricken mothers, sometimes teenage mothers, abandoning their children, um, uh, and sometimes they're brought up. And people say, it was, we're losing the strength of the nation because the mortality rate against these children who, who are just abandoned was very high, even they are brought into a foundling hospital. So Coram felt sorry for these poor um, fatherless children, well, motherless children too, indeed. So Tom Foundling is uh, this uh, lovable rogue. He's been abandoned at birth, adopted by a wealthy family, Squire Allworthy, one of the most sympathetic characters in, in, in Fielding's work, um, who uh, brings him up. And it's about his uh, um, uh, scapegrace youth. He's a harem scarum character. Um, he's a lovable rogue, a womanizer, and so on and uh, about his um, nubile girlfriend and all the rest of it. The, uh, I shan't give you a plot synopsis now, it's, it's too long, intricate and involved. Um, and uh, he's morally um, dubious. So um, Fielding saw lots of characters like that and it gave him material for, say, Jonathan Wilde, who was a, uh, just before Fielding's time as a judge. He would have been probably a child when Wilde was hanged. And Jonathan Wilde was playing both sides of the street in terms of the law, being a thief taker, but actually being a prolific thief himself taxing certain brigands saying all right i'll let you get away with your uh, your crime so long as you give me a share of the loot but of course um as a lawman he couldn't never catch people he had to catch uh, a minor criminal once in a while and send them to the gallows but eventually john the wild is exposed for what he is and he's sent to the gallows himself um now transportation came in as a punishment this time a fate worse than death transportation to america um, and go particularly to the southern colonies, people having to be a, um, a bonded uh, labourer, so live in servitude for, for seven years, 
because after 14 years you probably wouldn't survive that. But if you did, you were free in the southern colonies. Um, and obviously, when after the American Revolution, people were sent to Australia instead. So what else uh, about um, Fielding? Um, anyway, he suffered infirmity as he got to middle age, gout. Now, that can be from gross feeding. I'm not sure if it was in his case. He was certainly corpulent. Other people say, no, it's nothing to do with overeating. I think some people suffer gout who don't overeat. And uh, cirrhosis of the liver. So um, he uh, was uh, fond of strong waters. I don't think he was in a crapulous state when he delivered judgment in court because they say some judges are like that. But he was notably um, serious minded about this. He was uh, renowned for um, delivering equal justice and giving a um, sympathetic hearing to the penniless who were driven to crime by their economic cir circumstances. So considered an angel of mercy by, by relative standards, where, um, as I say, life was cheap. We actually put a price on it. It was a few shillings. That was grand larceny. That was enough to have you hanged, even for the first offence. It was a notorious case in the 18th century. I can't remember the young woman's name, where she attempted to steal some um, uh, cloth from a shop. She, she noticed that she'd been spotted doing it, so she put it back. She was nevertheless overpowered, then the citizen's arrest, and then uh, charged with grand larceny. Despite the fact that she, she, did, the fact that she didn't actually affect the, the, the crime, abandoned the theft halfway through, she was still sentenced to death and she was still executed. Anyway, that's how horrific it was in the 18th century. So the, the, the law was absolutely brutal for people who attempted to, to steal even a few shillings worth. Um, so he and his brother John, they set up the Bow Street Runners, sort of a police force, but only for London, around Bow Street, and there's still Bow Street Magistrates Court, as in um, some uh, students of international law might know, Bow Street Magistrate um, and um, Pinochet, Ugarte Number 1. Uh, when the erstwhile president of the Chilean Republic was um, had up before the mag on uh, charges of murder and torture and so forth. But anyway, eventually the, the, the senator for life was uh, given a one-way ticket to Santiago. I shan't go into that saga. So um, Fielding found that um, uh, metropolitan life didn't quite agree with him. Though, though, though those Bow Street runners had some sort of uniform, they had very limited powers because people said, oh, we can't have a police force because it looks like a standing army without the consent of parliament and that could lead to tyranny. It could be used to bulldoze parliament. We don't want to be like the continental countries like France or the various German states who've got some sort of police force. Uh, we'd rather have a high crime level. And so the Bow Street runners, I think they were really just were citizens in uniform, had no additional powers of arrest anyone or anyone else has and everyone is allowed to carry carry firearms, but nevertheless succeeded in, in reducing crime in the metropolis somewhat. Bear in mind London was expanding rapidly. It was the, 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 um, the birth pangs of the Industrial Revolution, the Agricultural Revolution was going on. So we're more efficient at producing food. We didn't need so many people toiling on the fields. More people coming to London with more job opportunities. So you're just walking into London from wherever your village is, seeking work as a labourer, a servant and so forth. Anyway, his first, first wife died and uh, then um, he defied social convention because he was a very independent man and married his maid, who was always carrying his child, but went on to have five more children with her. And of course, you can imagine that caused comment. Some people were scathing about this. Uh, it was a very snobby time because um, there was a Stygian gulf between the, the social classes and he was from the upper orders, um, she was not. So it was almost unprecedented. Uh, so he wrote a number of other novels, um, a no number of raucous plays such as Rape Upon Rape, I think you get the idea, uh, oh, and, and well, one play about uh, Jonathan Wilde, whom I mentioned. Uh, so his work is not very popular these days, it's, it's quite heavy going, the novels. Henry Fielding's the only one I've read, even though it's quite fast moving. A uh, number of different locales, almost all in, in South East England, and uh, some very colourful characters, such as he came across in his work as Chief Magistrate. But um, he decided not to spend too much time in Bow Street because it was too polluted. He felt aggravating his asthma. It was subject to ever more frequent and severe attacks. He feared it would be the death of him. So he lived in, in, in Twickenham um, on Holly Road. I don't think the house still stands here for a while in Barnes, um, just south of the Thames. Now, he had two sisters living in Turn Turnham Green, which is north of the Thames, only a few miles away. That was a village in Middlesex, so um, it's still in the countryside in those days. But uh, then he retired to Portugal and he died within a few months of um, arriving. So that's just a little bit about Henry Fielding, a novelist who's not very popular these days, but uh, ought to be more widely enjoyed. So please follow me on Instagram, on Facebook, on Twitter. Um, choose me as your tour guide in London whenever this COVID-19 dies away. Um, and you can do online lessons with me in English, in history, English as a foreign language, religious studies, politics, 
um, and I can't think what else, French, law. Uh, so choose me to help you with your coursework, your dissertation, your theses, and so forth. I help people with essays, I'll write articles and publications. Okay, toodaloo.